Hello and welcome back. Throughout his career, Jean Alesi had some absolutely shocking luck, which on multiple occasions cost him race wins. Take the 1991 Belgian Grand Prix, leading comfortably from Ayrton Senna when his engine gave up on him. Then there's Monza 1994, where he'd been fastest all weekend, taking pole with his teammate Gerhard Berger in second, and was running away with it on race day at almost a second a lap. Then a gearbox failure during his first pit stop abruptly ended what seemed to be a nailed on victory. Apparently, Lacey was so distraught he stormed off, ignoring his jet waiting at the airport, and flew off down the highway at nearly 260 km per hour. Think it stops there? Not even close. A year later, at the 95 Italian Grand Prix, Ferrari again looked on course for an Lacey led 1 2 until a side mounted camera fell off of Lacey's car and at his teammate's suspension at nearly 290 km per hour, causing Berger to retire. Then a wheel bearing failure nine laps from the finish would end a Lacey's race. If there is a god, he clearly isn't a Ferrari fan. That said, Alessi's bad luck wasn't exclusive to Ferrari. Take the famous 1996 Monaco Grand Prix, where amongst the mayhem, Alessi found himself comfortably leading until his Benetton suspension failed. But with all that bad luck, there was at least one day where things went his way. The 1995 Canadian Grand Prix. Coming into the race, Alessi was a distant fourth in the driver's standings, but Ferrari were right in the fight in the constructor's title testament to how much better the 412T2 was than its predecessors. Alessi qualified fifth just behind teammate Berger, Schumacher, Hill and Coulthard occupied the top three. Now the forecast had been mixed approaching the race weekend but had remained dry throughout qualifying, however on the morning of the race steady rain had been falling and continued to fall throughout the 30 minute warm up session causing several spins including both Williams drivers Hill and Coulthard. By the time the race started the rain had stopped and everyone was on slicks, but the track hadn't completely dried. Alex didn't get the best start, but managed to hold his position throughout the opening corners. First time through the hairpin, just behind the Lacey, Mika Hakkinen tipped Johnny Herbert into a spin, bringing both to a halt. Finding a dry line at first seemed to be proving tricky, as on lap 2 David Coulthard dropped his Williams under braking into turn 8, and beached it in the gravel. Coulthard later explained a bump in the track caused his spin. At that exact same moment, Alessi was reinforcing his credentials in changeable conditions, with an audacious move past his teammate to move into third. He instantly set after Hill and set the fastest lap. However, a lap later, Schumacher responded, going even faster, and started to pull away at the front. Even Murray Walker said Schumacher and his Benetton had been imperious, calling the car reliable and saying Schumacher seemed to have the race by the throat. Who doesn't love a Murray Walker commentator's curse, eh? Anyway, Alessi slowly reeled Hill in and on lap 17, with the help of a couple of backmarkers, made a fine move up the inside at the hairpin and took second. From there, it never looked like Hill would catch Alessi. Unfortunately, it wasn't looking like Alessi would catch Schumacher either. This would have been a bitter pill to swallow for Alessi as rumours had been circulating that Schumacher was being lined up to replace him at Ferrari. On lap 34, Alessi pitted for fuel and tyres. A lap later, teammate Berger came in for his stop, but very slowly. Another Ferrari failure? Fortunately, Berger was just low on fuel, and he coasted to his pit box, only just keeping himself in the race. But this would be a warning to Alessi. The Ferrari V12 was thirsty, and fuel management would play a part in making sure both Ferraris got home safely. Schumacher completed his pit stop five laps later, his stop was the quickest, and he was able to maintain a 30 second lead over Alessi. On any other day, job done. But for whatever reason, this day was different. Lap 58, Schumacher suddenly slowed. He pulled into the pits. A rare retirement? Not quite. An electronics issue meant the Benetton was stuck in gear. Schumacher had to wait for over 90 seconds while he switched steering wheels, and then engineer reprogrammed his electronics rejoining the race 7th. And just like that, Alessi was 11 laps from home, over 20 seconds clear of the Jordans behind him. Despite the gap, with all the bad luck that had haunted his career up to that point, and Berger's earlier fuel issue, they were not a comfortable final few laps for Alessi, but as he edged ever closer, he allowed himself to believe. It was finally happening. 
Every time I braked, my tears were hitting my visor, Alacy said afterwards. For about a lap, I felt a bit disorientated, but then I said to myself, now you've got to get back to driving. And he did. John Alacy would win his first Grand Prix after 91 attempts. The Canadian Grand Prix was supposed to be run over 69 laps, but the partisan crowd full of Ferrari fans invaded the track the moment Alacy crossed the line, meaning results had to be taken after 68 laps. The Tifosi was so touched with passion that many streamed full heartedly across the track, narrowly avoiding cars still racing at 180 miles per hour, recalled Motorsport Magazine's Mark Skewis. But the reason for fans' jubilation ran so much deeper than that. This was Circuit Gilles Villeneuve, named after the Canadian man who had won his first race here 17 years earlier, on home soil, and would go on to become synonymous with driving a number 27 Ferrari. Now a French-speaking racer, whose driving style and passion had brought comparisons to the great Villeneuve, also driving the number 27 Ferrari, had come home to finally win his own maiden victory at the circuit that bears Gilles' name. And it stretched even further than the partisan crowd. Alacy was liked throughout the paddock and his victory was a popular one. Even the curmudgeonly press, gloomily preparing to write up another Schumacher success, stood and applauded wildly, added Mark Skewis. The nearest modern day comparison I can think of for this result is probably Monza 2020. Lewis Hamilton looked to have another win nailed on until events transpired to position the talented and much loved Pierre Gasly in the lead and he took it home. Could you imagine if there had been a crowd there to see that one? Anyway, on the cooldown lap, Alacy's car suddenly spluttered to a halt out of fuel. He was that close to another crushing heartbreak. Schumacher stopped after himself recovering to finish fifth and allowed Lacey to get on, who waved to the crowds as the Benetton carried him back to the pits. Lacey was presented his trophy in front of a packed main straight, joined by the two Jordan drivers on the podium, the team's first double podium in their history. In his post-race press conference, Lacey said, winning with Ferrari is special, something you cannot get with any other team. I could not have wished for a better birthday present. Oh yeah, hadn't I mentioned, it was also his 31st birthday too. Jonathan Palmer would say of Alacy, Prior to Montreal, he was the most deserving driver who should have won a GP, but hadn't. I think from now on, he'll go increasingly well. But this wouldn't be a story about John Alacy if there wasn't a sting in the tail. Alacy would podium again, but never win. Even worse, rumours circulated that evening that Schumacher had signed a contract with Ferrari for 1996. Those rumours wouldn't be confirmed until the Hungarian Grand Prix, but the fact Alacy possibly lost his seat on the day that he finally won is just so... Jean Alacy.